If you want to, go ahead and turn to uh, Luke 17 and put your finger there. And then if you want to turn to Matthew 13 and put a finger there, we're going to read both those here in just a minute. <clears throat> I want to talk to you a little bit this morning about goals. Do you set goals? Do you say, you know, these are the goals I want to accomplish in the next year, two years, five years? As a church, and I want you to kind of think in a, in a dual approach this morning, uh, both individually and, and as a corporate entity, <coughs> as the body, what kind of, you know, the only time we really talk a lot about goals is, is with New Year's, and we call them resolutions. And, and if you're like me, after a while, you just quit making them. Why? Because you never keep them. And, and so we struggle with that. We struggle with the idea of setting goals. And, and I want to talk for just a second about the difference between wanting something and setting a goal. Let me give you some examples. <clears throat> you can say, I want to be skinny and wear the jeans I wore in high school. Some people get that goal, some don't. Or you can say, I have a goal to get healthy to eat right and exercise and, and be healthier. You can say, uh, I want more money. Or you can set a goal to be more fiscally responsible and, and, and plan for your future. You can say, uh, as a church, we want to grow. Or you can say, we're going to focus on how to minister to our community and develop a, a joint vision for how to reach people we care about. Do you see the difference in I want and, and, and a goal? Does that start to make sense? I want you to think for just a few minutes this morning about some of your goals. And if you don't have them, I want you to begin to think about them. And, and I want to encourage you today to, to begin to set some goals in your life. And I want us to think about uh, goals as a church. You see, here's what I've learned. If I don't set a goal, I never reach a goal. If I just had these vague ideas, I, I, I took a vacation, a couple actually that way. We said this word when I was when the boys were young, we would have adventures. I was telling somebody about this. We'd literally pull to the end of the driveway, flip the coin, and if it came up heads, we'd go right, if it came up tails, we went left. And we would do that until we found ourselves somewhere we wanted to spend the night. Which was fun sometimes, but more often than not, whenever we got to where we were going, we were unprepared to be there. We actually did that one time. We left our house and ended up on an island. Now, don't ask me how you flip coins and end up on an island, but we did. We got to Sandusky, Ohio. There was a, a ferry there going out to, uh, uh, what island were we going out to, Liv? Kelly's Island. We went out to Kelly's Island. And I said, heads, we get on the ferry, tails, we keep driving. We got on the ferry, went out to Kelly's Island. We set up our camp. I started the charcoal. <coughs> We broke out the steaks. Ooh, this was a great trip. And as the steaks were cooking, I looked at Liv and said, where's all the silverware plates and all that? And she looked at me and went, I thought you packed that. <laughs> now, you've never had an adventure until you're eating steaks with your fingers <laughs> and baked potatoes with your hands. It was, it was an adventure, all right? And I'm not saying that, that we didn't enjoy it to some extent, but I'm saying we got to where we wanted to be, but we weren't ready to be there. Does that make sense? And I think sometimes in our lives, <laughs> instead of setting goals, we just have things we want and we move. We might end up somewhere we want to be, but we might not be ready to be there. And let me tell you something, as a church, that's a dangerous thing. We can get a lot of people to come in here. But if we're not ready to minister to them and help them grow and help them find their place in Christ, if we're not ready for strangers to walk through the door and to be made felt to feel welcome and loved and cared about and to, to know how to share our faith with them in a way that will connect with them, not a way that makes us comfortable, if we're not ready for that, you know what? We'll have a lot of people come here and you know what will happen next? We'll have a lot of people leave here. And as a church, we'll just become kind of one of those 
doors you see when you go to the big city where you go in one side and you stay in it and you come back around and go back out. And I don't want us to be that church. And I don't want your life to feel like it's that life. So there has to be a secret to, to, to setting some goals and setting the course. And this morning, I want us to begin that journey. And I want us to understand the difference between wanting something and setting a goal and accomplishing it is, is one very simple concept. It's faith. Now, we don't set goals sometimes because we don't think we can achieve them. And we'll come back to that in a minute and talk about why we think that. But the truth is, if I set a goal and I don't really believe I can do it, if I say I'm going to get healthy, but I don't believe I'm going to get healthy, I won't. All right? We don't have faith. So let's go over to, to Luke chapter uh, 17. Go ahead. Now I'm just going to go there. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. Now, now. I want to make a real quick point. These weren't total strangers. These weren't non-believers. These were followers of Christ who knew him intimately. Who had seen him do incredible things. Now think about that. They've seen him walk on water. They've seen him heal the sick. They've seen him give sight to the blind. They've seen all these incredible things. And what are they asking for? An increase in faith. They're saying we still struggle. It's okay that we still struggle. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. He replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Let's go ahead and switch on over to Matthew chapter 13. Jesus speaking again says, He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. Now I want you to really catch the imagery here. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. Which a man took and planted in the field. Though it is the smallest of seeds, when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants. And becomes a tree so that birds come and perch in its branches. Now do you get the imagery here as we talk about the kingdom and we talk about faith? He says if you'll take just that little bit of faith and you'll plant it, God can create a place where those who need a home can come and find a place to be. Can find a place to rest. Can find a place to belong. If you just have this little bit of faith. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. And let's ask God to kind of lead us into breaking this down and making it our own. Father God, I thank you for your love and I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your kindness. And I thank you for faith. And Lord, this morning I pray for each and every soul in the building that you will increase our faith. That you will raise our heads and open our eyes and give us a vision for a future both individually and corporately, goals that you would set for us, both individually and corporately, and that you will call us to something great, much greater than, than we are, and that we will have the faith to pursue that. Thank you for your love and your grace. In Christ's name, amen. Now, <clears throat> This morning, I want us to, to talk a little bit about this, and I want us to be honest about what gets in our way. When it comes to setting goals, when it comes to, to, to really believing, because we say, I want, but do I believe that I'm going to be, do I believe that we're going to become a, a great church in our community? Do I really believe that? Do I believe? I heard someone say a few weeks ago, well, it won't be long, we'll need to have two services. Do I really believe that? Do I really believe that we're going to reach this point that we can't get everybody in? Do I really believe that, that more than just numbers, we're going to really start changing our community and our world? Do I really believe that we can make a real difference in people's lives? Because here's what happens. If I don't believe it, I don't do it. I may give lip service to it, but I'm just walking through it. I'm not committed to it. And I think there are obstacles. There are lies. You know, we talked a few weeks ago about truth and lies. 
Let me tell you some lies that keep us from living up to what God has for us. Let's go to the first one. The first one is, my problem's so big. Click that button one more time to see if it pops up. And I'm too small. Nope. Any of you have problems that seem like they're bigger than you? Don't raise your hand. You don't have to admit that. But have you ever been in that situation? Have you ever walked into a room that you needed to organize and it was just full and you look around and it's laughing? I can show you the room if you'd like. Have <laughs> you ever walk into that room and you look and you go, there are a thousand totes in here and i got to go through every one of them and what do you want to do as soon as you look at that? Well, let's just jump in here and start. <laughs> No, you go, I'm never, that's just too much. I'm not, I'm not going to get it. Now let's just go this way. And we don't try because it seems so big and we seem so small. And sometimes in the church when we talk about big visions, and, and, and folks, God's visions for us and for our church are big visions. They're not little things. God wants to do big things. And, and our answer is often we're too small. We're just a little church. That, that needs to be one of the big churches that do that. Well, we'll address that in just a minute. It's too wide and too deep. I can't tell you the number of times I've had somebody sit, not in this office, but in my office and other ministries, and say to me, you don't know how deep this is. How much this hurts. You don't understand. It's just not as simple as doing this or doing that. This is deep. Or this problem is so much broader than you understand. It goes way out and you don't get it. It's too wide. It's too deep. Let's go. There's too many of them. It should be a, yeah, and not enough of us. Well, let's be honest, guys. Look around your community. How big is the list of hurting people in Bloomfield? How big is the list of hungry people in Bloomfield? How big is the list of people who need someone just to, to smile and welcome them? That's just Bloomfield. And our ministry should be on, go beyond Bloomfield, wouldn't you agree? How big is the need of Green County, Southern Indiana, the state? Our goal should be that we reach everyone and anyone we can. And when we get down to that, we look at that, that's a huge goal. And we've got very limited resources. Would you not agree? We can say, well, we got, we got more than you know, preacher. Well, that may be true. But by comparative, compared to the need, just this week we had the uh, Feed the Children, the summer food program. And as I sat there listening to all the different things that needed done, I thought, man, this is a massive undertaking. But it seems to me every year God's supplying what we need. And if we start into that ministry with this idea that we have to have everything we need before we start, we'd never start. But the lie is, it's too many, too much. And I have too little, one more. And I think this is the, the one that gets most of us most often in our personal life. It's just too late. It's just too late. There's nothing left that I can do. I've tried, and it's over. Sometimes in our relationships, whether it's with a spouse or with a child or a parent, and we try our hardest to heal it and make it work, and we go, I tried, it's just too late. Sometimes as a church, we think we've just gone too far. We can't turn that corner. People are too, how many, how many of you ever heard this phrase? People are just too set in their ways. <laughs> You ever heard that? Not in church. I mean, that would never be uttered in church. <laughs> that, that has to do with sports or something else, right? It's just, you know. Or, how many of you ever seen, how many of you have had a Popeye moment in your life? I am what I am, and that's all that I am. <laughs> Don't expect me to change. Because this is who I am, and I want to change. I really do want to eat healthy. Just ice cream calls me. <laughs> and it's a 
great place of fellowship, and I, I hate to let other people down. I can't change now. I'm too old and too set in my ways. And nobody here, nobody in church has ever thought such a thing, have they? Well, let me address every one of these scripturally for you. Just kind of put in, in, in perspective our God. But before I do, go ahead and click. I, I want to give you all a gift. If you've uh, watched TV, you know, I, I thought about starting today with an infomercial. That would be kind of funny, you know, because I, I thought about saying, are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? <laughs> Have you noticed you're losing your hair at a rapid pace? Are you fighting the battle of the bulge and losing? Well, if you call right, how much would you pay for this miracle bill? But wait, there's more. These commercials that always promises miracle quick fixes. And I want you to know today I'm not offering you a quick fix, but I am offering you a miracle. Let me see here. Let's just start. If you need more, let me know. All right? I want to give you all something, and I want you to do something for me as you get these things. Jim, can you see to it that everybody over here gets one of those? As you get these things, I want you to do one thing. I want you to find a pen or a pencil. And I want you to write your name on them. Okay? And I'll come back to why that is significant. But I want you to write your name on these packets. I don't want you to open them. But I want you to understand that everything you need to achieve your goals. You can start it that way. If we run out, let me know. Everything you need to achieve your goals, you have in your hands. But I want you to write your name on it. It's important. That you write your name on a borrow a pen from a neighbor. Sometimes in the pew there's a pen or a pencil. On the front of that packet, I want you to write your name, and I want you to hang on to this. Alright? And then I want us to look at our excuses for not setting goals and not doing things that make a difference. Go ahead there, Luann, hit my next button for me. So big, so small. Be easy for us to say that the need is too big and I'm too small, but I want to remind you of what God does. And I want, I want to give you a point of reference when you have a little faith. Go ahead and click that for me. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, we read the conclusion of one of our favorite childhood stories. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. You all, not, now let me back up. Some of you know this story. Forgive me when I say you all, okay? Some of you know this story, but let me, let me put it in perspective. The Philistines are camping on this hill, the Israelites on this hill, they want to go to battle, but no one can gain a tactical advantage. The Philistines have a giant by the name of Goliath who is one. huge. And he comes out every day and he challenges the Israelites. You send out a warrior, you, he fights me. If I win, we win. If he wins, you win. And that's how we'll solve this. Did we have enough? You need some more? Okay. There's three. Do we need more than three? There's one. There's another. Okay. Okay, we've got more back there. So day after day, the Philistine challenges the Israelites, and finally a young man by the name of David shows up. The son of a shepherd, a man who'd been tending sheep. And he takes up the challenge and he goes out to fight Goliath. Now I want you to hear carefully something that's very important. Before he goes out, the king of that time was a man by the name of Saul. And Saul takes David into his tent and he says, Okay, if you're going to fight, let me give you what you need. And he tries to give him his armor and his sword. Here's the problem. David was a small, younger man. Saul was, uh, when he was selected as king, was selected and it says he was head and shoulders taller than ever. Saul was a huge guy. And so nothing that Saul had would fit for David. And David Two. tries it and says this doesn't work. And then he goes out with a sling and some stones. And he puts the sling in the stone, or a stone in the sling. He swings it around. And I remember this as a boy. Some of you remember this song, don't you? And one little sling, stone went into the sling, and the sling went round and round, and round and round and round and round. Anybody? You all look at me like you've never heard that. That's really disappointing that you missed out. And one little stone went up in the air. Anybody else? Please help me out. And the giant came tumbling down. I got that. Uh, 
and went to work. He didn't try to fit somebody else's armor. He didn't try to be someone else's warrior. He was who he was. He was comfortable in his skin. And he said, this is how I have fought in the past, and this is how I'll fight now. He said, I've killed the lion, and I've killed the bear. I've used these tools before. I'll use what I have, and I'll go to work. Now, let me say this. If your goal is to become like someone else, it's the wrong goal. Unless that someone else is Jesus. If your goal is, I want to be, I want to read as many books as so and so, or I want to be as good at sharing my faith as so and so, stop that. I want to be able to quote this, or I want to be, now say, God, what do I, what, is, what are my gifts? And how do I use them? If as a church, please hear me out, as a church, if we start looking around and trying to figure out what some other church is doing, that's making people come, and we go, well, let's do that. We're not going to be blessed. We're not going to grow. Because all we're going to do then is try to imitate somebody else for the sake of numbers. Instead of saying, Lord, what is it that you gave us? What are our gifts and strengths that we can use to change the world? And I believe that should be our goal, is to change the world. Lord, what is it that you want to accomplish through the individual? Which neighbor do you want me to reach? Which coworker do you want me to speak to? And stop trying to mimic what we see in someone else. Stop trying to become something that we're not. <coughs> or to do something we're not gifted to do. You know that I play the guitar a little bit and, 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 and I sing a little bit. But the worst thing in the world you could ever ask me to do is say, Scott, we'd like for you to play piano next Sunday. Because if I play piano next Sunday, there are three songs that we might be able to sing, and none of them would we ever sing in church. <laughs> All right? I can sit down there right now, and I can play you the beginning of Color My World. I can play you part of the old rock anthem, You're Cold as Ice. Maybe that would work in church. <laughs> no, no. no. And I could play Lean On Me. I guess we could do that. Guess what? Playing the piano is not my gift. And, and let me say, I say that to say this. For years, for years, I had a friend who plays piano. And I would sit and I'd watch him play and I'd watch other people. Lord, beautiful job this morning. And I'd watch somebody play and they play so well. And Carolyn, we're so blessed. And I'd sit there and I'd go, I wish I could play the piano. I wish I could play the piano. I wish I could play the piano. And then one one day, while I was wishing to play the piano, God said, why don't you play your guitar? Well, I do play the guitar. Why don't you play that? I don't play it well, but I play it. And if I pick it up and spend a little more time playing my guitar, and a little less time worrying about playing the piano, I might find that God could use my guitar. If I'd stop trying to fit into somebody else's mold. When I first started preaching, I had two or three preachers that I admired. And I tried so hard to be them. I had a preacher by the name of Kerry Allen. Some of you might know Kerry. He used to be over at uh, Mount Pleasant. Went on to be the president of Bluefield College of Evangelism. Could read and speak Hebrew and Greek better than I can English. And in his sermons, he's always quoting Greek and always quoting Hebrew. And he did it flawlessly. And so I would try and I would kill it. I mean, I would murder words. Wouldn't even be close. But I wanted to be like Carrie. And then, then I, I wanted to be like Ed Bowsman, so I tried to change my brogue and my delivery to sound more, 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 I sound much more uh, preacher than I am. I preach all the lyrics. I think people will really like it if I, if I tell the story. And I should write the lyrics. You know? And I'd have these feelings. And then one day, the best advice I got, I got from, from Carrie. He said, he said, be yourself. Stop trying to imitate. I'll never be the preacher God calls me to be if I'm trying to imitate someone else. You'll never be the person that God can use effectively if all you're doing is, is envying or trying to imitate someone else. And we'll never be the church God wants us to be if all we do is compare what other churches are doing and try to match up. So just be yourselves. They're so big. The life was big. God took him out with a stone. There's nothing that we're going to take under our belt that as long as we're ourselves, if God leads us into battle, we win. It's that simple. All right? 
move on. It's too wide, it's too deep. And this is a scary thing. It's kind of frightening sometimes to think about <coughs> dealing with that ocean. I remember the first time I, I saw the ocean. I grew up in these parts, and, and, and the biggest body of water I ever saw was the lake at Spring Mill. <laughs> and then we head down to Myrtle Beach, and, and you get out and you walk. And I remember one of my children going, where does that end? Like, I have no idea. Somewhere way over there. Now, I know there's something over there, but man, that's huge. And that next step is massive. Well, let me give you two examples of, of how faith can work for us. First of all, there's the children of Israel. When fleeing Egypt and, and an army pursuing them, and have you been in that place in your life where you're just trying to get through, and all of a sudden you hit that wall? You're walking out of Egypt, you've got an army bearing down, and there's an ocean in front of you. What do you do? You keep walking. And God parts the water by faith. The people passed through the Red Sea on dry land, but when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. Here's the difference. God called the children of Israel to walk, to move through the, the sea, and when he did, he parted. He made a way. I'm going to tell you right now, if God's calling you as an individual to a ministry or a work, he'll make a way. And you've got to trust that. If God is calling us as a church to a ministry or a work, he'll make a way and keep moving. Now let me bring up one other example though. Go ahead. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 28 through 30, one of my favorite stories. The disciples are in a boat, Jesus on the shore, they look and here he comes. And he's walking on the water. Now one of the things that cracks me up, by the way, is my mic on? Yes. Is it now? I know I'm loud. Okay, now I'm on, okay. Uh, Jesus walking out. Now, one of the things that cracks me up is it says the disciples were afraid and they said it's a ghost. All right? Now, we're going to pick it up right there. They're thinking there's a ghost walking on the water. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. If it was a ghost, what would the ghost have said? Come on! That has to be one of the dumbest things I've ever heard in my life. If you're really God, tell me to come because no ghost would try to trick me. I think deep down Peter knew it was Christ. And he was just saying, hey, if that's you, call me and I'll come. Come, he said, that's Jesus speaking. Then Peter got down out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind... He was afraid and began to sink and cried out, Lord, save me. Now here's the thing I, I want you to catch in this. Two things. Jesus called him, And Peter kept his eye on Christ when he walked on water. He did what we would say was impossible. The depth of the water didn't matter anymore. Why? Because Jesus said, come here. And he kept his eyes on Jesus. And what happens when he took his eyes off Jesus? Boom. Now let me say this, and, and I cannot say this emphatically enough. As a church, if we start running after every fad and every popular move, and whatever everybody else is doing, we'll sink a lot. But if we seek the Lord and say, Lord, where do you want us to go? And you tell us, Lord, and wherever you call us to, we'll go to. And we'll keep our eyes fixed on you. If we do that, we'll walk on water. We'll do amazing things that nobody thought we could ever do. But the moment we take our eyes off Jesus as a church, we're going to sink like a stone. I promise you. We'll be lost. Now, God in these two examples, can make a way through the water, or he can let you walk right across the top. If you have faith. If, and this is important, if it is God who is setting the goals, not you. 
If it is God who is calling you to it, not your own desires. I would love to see every seat in this building full and a need to fill them up a second time and a third and a fourth. Not so that we can say we're the biggest church in Bloomfield. Not so that I can say I'm the preacher of the biggest church in Bloomfield. I want to see this place full and I want to see it full of people we don't know. Because there's people we don't know who need Christ and we know Him and can introduce the two. If God calls us to great things, get out of our boat. Walk through the water. And I think both are equally scary. But faith will see you through. Let's look at the next one. There's too many of them and not enough of us. Our resources are too small. I'd like to, I'd like to go on a mission trip. Anybody here ever think, I'd like to go on a mission trip? But they're expensive. It amazes me how much it costs a man to go do something for the Lord. Have you noticed that? If you want to go to Haiti, you better have about five, six thousand dollars. You can go on a nice cruise for that, can't you? I want to go serve the Lord, but it costs money. What do I do with that? Well, once again, it, it, it comes down to our focus. Am I focusing on the need or the provider? Am I focusing on what we don't have or what we do? What 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 one resource do we have all the time? All the time, the power of the Most High. Let's go ahead and pull up this scripture here in Matthew chapter 14. Jesus replied, and let me again set the stage. 5,000 people hanging out. Here Jesus teaches, and they're hungry. And you know it's hard to listen when you're hungry? That's why I listen real close. When I start hearing people's stomach growl, I wrap it up. <laughs> I'm going to start having Subway delivered so we can stay <laughs> So they come and they say, hey, there's a lot of hungry people here. Why don't you send them home? Jesus says, so Jesus replied, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. Now, I, I've often thought about this. I think this is part of Jesus' sense of humor. I really do. I think Jesus, you know, some of the other references, he tells Philip at one point in time, who Philip uh, was very pragmatic, and he says, uh, Philip, why don't you feed them? Can you imagine that you're standing there and there's 5,000 people and you're going to <laughs> These guys need to go home. And Jesus said, what do you feel? You got the wrong guy here. Let's keep going. No, 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 no. back up. I'm sorry. No. If you just hit the opposite direction on your thing. Your arrows. Should be able to hit the up arrow or the back on the, on the computer itself, Louie. <coughs> you know the little up and down arrows? No. Go back the other way. There you go. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fishes, they answered. Bring them here, he said to them. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fishes, looking up to heaven. He gave thanks, he broke the loaves, and he gave it to his disciples, and his disciples gave it to the people. And guess what? Everybody got enough. And, and so much, I always think this is cool. How many, do you remember how many baskets were left over? Well, one for each disciple. And I honestly believe that was, that was on purpose. Here's a reminder for each of you that when I say something needs to be done, it can be done. Okay? Now let me give you a really simple, simple, simple thought. <clears throat> what you have with Jesus is always more than enough. That's it. What you have with Jesus is always more than enough. And without him, it's never enough. That's it. Now, if we look around and we say, what resources do we have as a church? Oh, we can list a lot of good things. But I'm telling you, all of our good things without Christ aren't good enough. And then we can look and we can say, well, if we want to do this or we want to do that, we don't have enough. I'm telling you, we have more than enough. As long as we have Jesus. We just have to make sure the two are combined. And again, I hope you're seeing this pattern. If we take what we have, if we listen for Jesus to call, 
We trust that he'll provide what we need and jump in the fray. Guess what? He shows up and we do great things. And we accomplish the goals that God sets for our lives and our church. Let's address the last one. Now we're going to move on. It's too late. Preacher, I'd like to say, yeah, I'm all for it. Let's go. I just, I don't know. And on a personal level, you know, I've been at odds with that person for so long, there's no way we'd ever get fixed. Or, you know, we don't even speak to each other, and if I tried, they wouldn't listen. I've been fighting this addiction. I've been fighting this weakness my whole life. I've just resigned myself, but I'm, I'm always going to be this. It's just too late. It's just too late. Go ahead and click that. In John 11, we have an incredible story. And, and I want us to, to pay attention to some things here together for a moment. It says, Jesus wants more deeply moved. And, and what's happened is... Mary and Martha have a brother named Lazarus and, and they're friends with Jesus and Lazarus is sick and, and they call for him and Jesus doesn't come right away and Lazarus dies. And when he arrives, they're upset and the house is upset and everybody's upset and Jesus shows up and Jesus is addressing the problem now and he comes to the tomb and says, Jesus once more moved, <coughs> deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. That sound familiar, by the way? Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, now I want you to catch this. Jesus is about to do this incredible thing. And what does Martha do? Martha tells him how he can't do it. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Somebody's telling Jesus what he can't do. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. I'm pretty sure if a guy's been dead for four days, you'd feel like it was too late. I think that's a reasonable conclusion. But let me say this, and please don't be offended by this. Sometimes in our churches, there's a bad odor that's been there for a while. Because we haven't been honoring God. Because we haven't been seeking God. Because we haven't been doing what we want. And, and I want to say this, and it's important that we address this. If we want to reach people for Christ, new people for Christ, people who don't go to church, we've got to know or recognize that, that everything that we do because we're comfortable in it may not minister to them. And if we stay in our comfort zone, we create an offense to them that makes them feel unwelcome or unloved. Now, I'm not saying that's us. I'm just saying churches can do that. Churches can be so set in their ways that, man, when a new person comes, they're just not made to feel like they fit or belong. And especially if they're unchurched. We have to be aware of that. It creates a bit of a stench. And there are churches people won't visit because of that. But let's move on. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, <coughs> catch that phrase, if you believe, you will see the glory of God. Man, that's a promise you should highlight in your Bible. If you believe, you will see the glory of God. So they took the stone away. Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you have sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen cloth around his face. Jesus said, you're not done. Now, I want to make a point here real quick. And I know we're long on time. I'm going to try to hurry on up. The Bible records that when Jesus gets to the tomb, he weeps. And I always wrestled with what was he crying about? I'm convinced Jesus was crying because he had to bring Lazarus back. Because I'm convinced Jesus knew Lazarus was in a place that was better than anything he'd know in this world. And I think for Lazarus, it was probably 
simply a hard thing to be brought back from that place to this place. His power, and to confirm he was the Son of God, he had to do this, and it broke his heart to bring his friend back from where he was to where he needed him to be. Now that's a scoff. Don't go home and say, well, this is a whack. This is what I believe. All right? But I know this fact. Lazarus was dead. He was dead for four days. He began to stink. And Jesus brought him back to life and proved his power. I don't care about your failures of the past. I care about your focus in the future. I don't care about, now please hear me out, I have compassion for the things that, that you've been through as a church. But I don't care about what's happened in the past here. I don't care about what, what good, bad, or indifferent different ministers did. I don't care about the successes and failures and what groups you were part of and what groups you weren't. I'm not worried about any of those things because guess what? Those things are all dead to me and you. What I care about. And what I want you to care about is what God's going to do with a church that's focused on Him and committed to investing its resources to glorify Him. <clears throat> Go ahead and click that next slide. There's what you hope for and what you believe. Now you have in your hand, in that little packet, is one single tiny mustard seed. If you fill that packet closely, you might be able to fill it. Don't squeeze it, though, because you'll crush it. There's a little mustard seed in there. Now, here's a couple things I want you to notice. Your name should be on that packet. Why? Because it's got to be your faith that leads you, not mine. I can't have enough faith for you, and your mom can't have enough faith for you, and your friend can't have enough, or your husband or your wife can't have enough. It's got to be your faith. And if it's not your faith, it does you no good. But now the question is, what do you truly believe God's going to do in your life? How big is your faith? Is it that big? I can't make a small enough thing that you can see to show you. All I can do is hand you this envelope. In that envelope, there's enough faith for you to move mountains. For you to create a place for people to come and find hope and belonging. For you to overcome whatever obstacle God has placed in your life. There is no, there is no too big, too wide, too deep, not enough. None of those things matter. If you believe. Now. I've said a lot the last few weeks about the getting on Facebook. I'm not going to ask you to do Facebook this week. I'm going to give you something everybody can do. I want you to take this envelope and I want you to carry it with you. I want you to keep it with you. And I want you to begin to, to wrestle with this question. What is it God wants to do with you? Please don't say I'm too old. Please don't say I'm too young. Please don't say it's too late. Please don't say I have too little. Please stop making excuses. And say this. Say, God, I, I want you to take this out. I want you to hold it at night and in the morning. And say, God, what do you really want to do with me? And how do you want to change my world? I know you love the people around me. How do you want to use me to make a difference? And God, how do I fit in that picture of the body that meets there at, at the corner of, of Spring at Jefferson? And how do you want to use us? And what, what great work do you have for us? And how do I fit there? If you're not from here, whatever church is your home, Lord, how do I fit there? How do I impact there? How do I make a difference there? And then I want you to, as the week plays out, I want you to begin to, on the back of that envelope, set a goal. I want you to set a goal. I want you
you to say, God, I want to do what you want me to do. Show me what you want of me. And then set a goal based on what God reveals to you. And say, I'm going, not I want, I'm going to do this by the power of God. I'm going to see this come to reality. Believe it. And then watch God go to work in ways that will amaze you. We're going to stand in a minute. We're going to stand in number 337. If you need somebody to pray with you, if you wrestle with your faith, if you just want to say, increase my faith, you can come up here and I'll be glad to pray with you. Or you can catch me when I'm done. Or you can catch one of a lot of folks in this room and say, would you just pray with me for a minute? We'll find a quiet corner and we'll pray with you. Or you can call tomorrow and come by. I don't care. But take a moment as we say it. And, and offer yourself to the Lord and commit yourself to keeping that in the Lord and letting it be real. Let's stand and let's sing.